Hey, good afternoon. I'm Joey Hernandez, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about looking at your critical information, your critical systems, and your critical personas from the eye of the adversary. The problem in today's time, we don't know what we don't know, and we don't know what's important. And we're going to talk a little bit about the why behind it. First, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Joey Hernandez. I'm former DOD member working in information operations tactics development uh, from the tactical to strategic delivery of engagements. Uh, led a, for the Department of Defense, led a cyber hunt team on retrospective analysis, worked in security cooperations in the regions of Africa and Europe. What that really entailed was working with partner nations and allies to help them develop some cybersecurity capabilities, uh, mostly defensive, but supporting everything with therein. Um, Previous strategic network warfare planner for the U US European Command. Uh, what that really meant was the plans, operations, from tactics all the way to strategy for cyber operations as a military strategist and special operations, cyber analysis, and plans supporting uh, those kind of things and the region. Um, looking at the different forms of what kind of special operations could be leveraged through cyber analysis and planning. On the commercial industry side, I worked with Carnegie Mellon University uh, and part of the Software Engineering Institute support, uh, you know, supporting organizations such as other FFRDCs and Department of Homeland Security as well. Also worked as a university and college professor on cybersecurity and criminal justice. Currently, I'm the sector chief for financial services for InfraGuard here in the Tampa, Florida region. Uh, worked in the Tampa Code Camp to provide uh, a briefing on cybersecurity and then also a participant in CSFI and, and a couple other initiatives. The picture here really is when it all got started uh, back in two, 2007 when uh, Estonia had the, the move the, the the Russian statue from the center of Tallinn to the outskirts to a cemetery. And there was a, a big attack that occurred uh, against Estonia working in a tactics squadron, looking at the ways that we would mitigate or how we would approach defensive measures. Um, and then when I got an opportunity uh, in the 2013 to 2018 timeframe working in Europe, got an opportunity to go out and support Estonia and basically the Baltics on the cybersecurity exercise called Baltic Ghost, which was defense of that re region. Uh, there's a couple of good articles out there that you can you can search to see what, what kind of we worked on. Um, but while I was out there, I got an opportunity to get a picture with the statue that really uh, led me into getting involved with cybersecurity. As we walk the engagement today, we're going to cover a couple of things, right? Understanding that where all this development came from on the work that I've been doing in the past couple of years, probably the last four years working commercial and also working on the government side of the house. You know, understanding that the insights of critical information, critical systems, and critical personas that because of organizations already exist, we should know some of these things. But in, you know, the dealing with over 150 clients in these last four years, one of the things I've asked the critical question is, what do you know about these things and how are systems prioritized? And the question always comes back is, we don't know. And, and really determining why something's critical. If you think about prioritization, it makes it difficult with organizations when these fundamental uh, things aren't easy to identify in organizations. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that today to try to, to help you um, ascertain the ability to get after this problem. As I spoke earlier, I talked about coming with a background in the Department of Defense and then also with the government sector. And there's a couple of doctrine documents that speak to, you know, what is this critical infrastructure? What is this cyber terrain? And a lot of the things are overlapping. But as we dig into this, I really want to just, you know, kind of wrap it down to the, this paragraph here as we walk through it. So identifying what cyberspace terrain is relevant from a business unit standpoint, right? From that specific business, whether it be the finance, the HR, the legal, those teams, those business units. And then often there are pieces of the cyberspace terrain, that infrastructure that are critical for that business unit or network function that are not obvious, right? So say this is a, a specific server or something in a closet. And for the case that we'll talk through today is really that all the financial or HR information that data passes through, right? That, that information at rest, that information at transit, these are all things that are tying into these CMMC, some other things that are coming into play over the last couple of years. But 
the process really of identifying this terrain or this infrastructure, this critical information requires both technical understanding and the knowledge of the C-suite's um, mission or their objectives. I'm really understanding what's going on with the business. And then this helps translate into technical tasks, moving from the strategic down to the technical so we can understand what you can put in work streams for the organization to develop and implement security measures to, to support this. And now this is just a sample of an org structure, but understanding that what typically happens in org structures in these different business units that the personnel issues often switch over to the technology side, right? So people are in specialized silos. There's not, not a lot of communication that occurs across these realms. And then there's that disconnect of what's important, right? What's important to the big, bigger business at large. Um, organizations are resistant to change because of the fact that we follow this, 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 um, structure that we do. Divisions have their own priorities. They have their own teams that are doing some of the things. They're competing for the same resources, trying to figure out whose budget is going to affect whose budget, right? And then there's a lot of times that implementation of, of technologies gets overlapped because people are trying to purchase things in the way that they think they, they should be authorized to purchase. And so those are some of the initial challenges, but we'll try to, from a technology standpoint, break it down to something that's more understandable for, for you in the organization. So as you see to the right, um, really pulled up that piece of breakout from the president down to these business units, right? So then you get an opportunity to understand that we broke out finance, looking at critical systems of the CRM, maybe a billing system, but at the highest level, um, we all understand that there's bigger ways that um, adversaries, threat actors are looking at the organizations, looking at the, the, the country at large, if you will. There's this diplomatic information, military economic standpoint um, when it comes to nation state actors, the political, military, economic, social inf information and infrastructure. And then looking at from a targeting perspective, which is facility, individual, virtual equipment and organizations, right? Now, the ones that I highlighted in red are really those things that you can look at from a business standpoint. Even though you see the, the intelligence or information that's shared from nation state actors, that you break it down to something that's bite-sized that you can actually have or affect change. Right? And, and so these are those economic implications, the social implications, those individuals, the virtual environment, infrastructure, and your organization. So we 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 maneuver it or manipulate it so that it's actually something we can leverage from a, a technical and security architecture implementation measure in our organization. With the previous in mind, now we move over to some of the things that we know, the known knowns, right? Um, leveraging here, I'm, I'm pulling the information from, from SecureWorks, looking at the, the, the annual report, uh, which I'll provide a link later on, talking about the active threat groups, some of the incident response engagements we've seen, and then some of that, uh, that initial access vectors, right? This parity, if you will, kind of helps you understand when you start thinking about building the threat against your organization, what, what really could occur. Right? So we know these are the things that are happening. We know this is what we're seeing. So there's validation and due diligence from that information. So looking at these first, we have vulnerabilities in internet facing devices, stolen credentials, brute force, password spraying, malicious email, third party, insider, pre-existing malware infection. And this is from that initial access vector. So we'll address how each of these plays out. If you look at the chart um, to the lower side, you can see that there are some other pieces that have occurred after that initial access vector. So there's a business email compromise, botnet operations, point of sale theft, malware, and then actually those threat actor groups. And some of the major amount of things that have occurred that caused us to do that level of work, which is why we have to start defining what's critical to us, right? So you see ransomware 45%, that's important, but understanding what it is that's gonna be impacting is what you have to highlight to your organization so you can actually implement some defensive measures. Now, I know when you first look at what you see from the Carver methodology, it seems a little bit uh, 
wouldn't say scary, but it looks like there's some some challenging here. But understanding that the carbon uh, target analysis vulnerability, vulnerability assessment methodology, it's a system that's been used for a long time. It was originally used by the Special Activities Branch from the CIA. Uh, there's other thoughts on who it came from, but really the, the, the aspect here is we're going to try to get you to understand uh, some of the ways you can leverage the Carver methodology to be able to help your organization in those different business units understand how to prioritize those things. So we'll talk initially about how you would have this conversation. So you would be reaching out to the staff and the business units, the team leads, the, the first line level managers and ask the simple question, hey, can you give me the top 10 uh, critical systems you use? Right. And then ask about critical information. But first, we're going to start with the critical systems. So you'd ask them to make a list of 10. So you talk to two different business units and and one of them may say telephone. One may say Facebook. Right. Facebook being something that they use to do some marketing. Right. So you're going to get some of these one offs. But you provide fidelity by accepting what it is that they provide you, these top 10. And then you rack and stack. You put those comparable to what what is the common Right? There's going to be some common things that people are going to talk about because some things they know, but because they're not technical, they also may not be aware of some of the systems that they use, that they don't know they use. However, as we walk through this first step, I'm going to try to make it simple and explain. There's a lot of verbiage here, but the verbiage is, is something you would carry for you to do the, we'll call it the, 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 the qualitative to quantitative analysis in the background. So for instance, we'll look across the top at the Carver which is the acronym, right? And then I'll walk you through the pieces. So if, if you have a criticality of a level one, that loss would not affect the business performance, right? So it wouldn't be a bit, really, really be uh, business impacting. And then if we look across to accessibility, difficult to achieve and requires more resource knowledge. So it may be a, some kind of system that you have out there, but it's pretty difficult for a bad actor, like even an insider, uh, difficult for them to achieve access to it, right? We get to recoverability, immediate replacement, and readily re re redundant two to four hours. So you can think about a system that you have that you have a backup for, you have a service agreement, service level agreement with a two hour response time. You have an on site technician who works this particular uh, capability. So you might be able to restore this in a faster time frame. And now we'll move over to B for vulnerability. A dedicated actor does not have the capability and expertise to attack it, right? So it's not really easy for uh, an actor to go against this. For instance, if this was uh, something that's on its own network, there's no connectivity to it, you're using a standalone system, something like that, right? So you could put a level at that high, um, at, at that lowest level there. And the effect, right? So no unfavorable impact. If you think about some, some items you have that if you were to take the system down, there's no vulnerability to the, to the data on it. Uh, and maybe it doesn't process that much. We, unfortunately, we do have systems that aren't that, aren't that big from an impact standpoint, from, a, from an effect. And the recognizability, still, we're just sticking across that value of one. Extremely difficult to recognize without assistance, right? So it's using a certain type of protocol, or it's using different ports. We have it on its own, its own VLAN. There's some things that would make it difficult for a bad actor. Uh, sometimes I'll say adversary, but a bad actor to be able to find out where this is or what it is inside a network environment, right? And so if you look across, you see that the values from the top to the bottom go from, uh, you know, less scary, if you will, a point of view to a more impactful uh, point of view. And now I put a couple of examples on the bottom, just racking, stacking a couple of systems. And this was just, a, you know, me trying to, help you know design and, and build out what we would be looking at for an example uh, as we walk through the, the challenges of having this on on uh, on our own network. So some of the carver considerations here are built from a Chris Calvert, he, he uh, cyber defense me who wrote some information on some of the considerations you would have if you were looking at the criticality, accessibility, recoverability, vulnerability effects and recognizability. And so leveraging a, a couple of things, it's, it's those thought processes that you would have to start trying to weigh what we had in the previous slide. And we'll get back to another slide that, that makes, um, puts this together for you. But you know, from criticality, what is the value of the asset to the core business? Is there an impact on business operation? Does it bother competitiveness? Does it impact your stock price if, if something were to happen to this system, right? And thinking about where Carver originated from, it originated from physical security in the sense that, hey, if this building, uh, this, this building 
was destroyed, what what could happen here, right? So we walk through that in those same those same mind, mindset with a variation of cyber being the, the implication here. So accessibility is it buried in a protected network? Where does it sit? Does it in the, sit in the DMZ? Um, we look at recoverability, as I spoke to a couple examples there, the cloud and dedicated hardware. Is there on-site person supporting this? Could they get it back up and running as quickly? Do you have uh, that, that redundancy? Vulnerability, is it hardened? Is it, you know, where does it sit? Effects, you know, could it, could it be company ending? Is there a danger of life or limb, right? If we think about some of the OT systems. The recognizability, easy text patterns. You know, think about the, the fact from passwords. Uh, if there's not, uh, as I said earlier, for the different ports and protocols that are being used, if it, is it on its own VLAN? Those kind of things to, to help you. And again, this, this information will be available afterwards, but these are kind of those things that help you determine where it sits when you're trying to weigh uh, what the measurements are, right? That, that quantitative piece uh, after having that initial conversation. So bringing the previous information back, now let's walk through an example, right? So we use, I use Salesforce just simply enough because mostly everyone knows what that is and understands it's, it's a customer relationship management or CRM, if you will, and walking through some of the weights, right? So on the criticality side, I weighed it with a five, maybe you wouldn't, but this is how you get some of that math started. And we haven't put the design-based threat to it yet. This is just from those initial thoughts that we had. So. For example, the application has a lot of information required to continue the business. So if I rated it a five, you can see on the chart at the top, right, that, that we have the, 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 the C for criticality, that loss would be a business stopper, right? Again, maybe that's a four, but working through the math as we try to come up with this, and it doesn't change that much here, as you'll see in the bottom when we walk through this. And then accessibility. I said somewhat accessible, right? Again meaning that, you know, giving it a three, meaning that it's somewhat accessible, it probably has a web-enabled entranceway. Uh, and so that may be something that we, we have to look at from a security standpoint. Again, not throwing the, the full threat. This is us looking at those key pieces we had. Recoverability, we say easily replace, restored in two to four, I mean, 24 to 48 hours because of the fact that we do have contracts. We have SLAs and software as a service, these kind of things may be in place. Now, again, this is with, with me building the numbers on my own. What if we have an SLA that says they won't respond for 72 hours, right? The person, the vendor, the support, the third party, well then that recoverability changes, right? We may not be able to get it up for five to seven days or 37 to 30 days, what, those kind of things. And then we look at the vulnerability. Does the CRM um, scan uploaded files? We'll see as we walk through this scenario piece of it, right? Uh, is there any security measures on each end of this, you know, as, as files or information is in there, what kind of integrity do we have? Are there any current CVEs out on it? Um, and we look at the effect. If it's compromised, uh, would it impact the customers? You'd probably say little to impact to no impact, maybe, you know, if depending on what kind of compromise, right? If the data is extracted, if it's, uh, you know, customer data that get, get, gets extracted by the threat, then maybe this changes as well. But when you're doing that initial look at measurement, trying to find out which systems you prioritize. Understand that it may change as you as you move forward, but it becomes something that you have to work through. Now, on the on the recognizability, you know, I, I said here recognize with moderate uh, technical expertise because of the fact that you know it's very often used in many organizations. There are things that are known out there on the web uh, with regards to. Uh, threats and vulnerabilities to this specific CRM. Now we see that after looking at some of those things, we, we go ahead and weigh out, right? We put numbers against the, the rest of the items that we have on the screen here. Salesforce is the CRM, a client billing server, SQL server, Active Directory. Active Directory is pretty high, right? Because we know that there's currently things that exist. Again, we haven't put a, des a specific design based threat against our specific community, our specific um, landscape, our specific enterprise network, right? We haven't done that aspect to it, but we know that from experience, these are some of the things that you as a SME would be providing to the leadership once you get the rest of the information. But this is just a uh, foundational look of how we would weight some of these things based on the list.
So now that you know you've rack and stacked some of those initial things, now you're trying to build that cyber design base threat, right? These are the things that have more validity to what can actually occur, right? So now that you have those things stacked, you also put um, an understanding of what could really occur. So leveraging tools, you got CSI Linux at the top left, looking at some of the domain, domain looking at uh, some of the information that exists on your environment, right? What you can see, can you see some of this information? Can you see these tools? Can you see the web interface? Are there any vulnerabilities that exist, right? So that's you doing your own research. Then you pull some of the resources from information that's out there, right? A lot of vendors will put out uh, not only vulnerabilities, but talk. There'll, there'll be news articles about uh, some some information. There'll be blogs about what's going on. For instance, software as a service data was it, this is for 2022. It was a target of 50 percent, 51% of ransomware attacks, and more than half of those attacks were successful. You know, can they even if they're not hitting the the software as a service? Maybe somebody's targeting specific uh, customers of the same product because they know that they can leverage their password and their, let's say, the lack of MFA, uh, multi-factor authentication. They'd be able to, to leverage that. Another report here talks about uh, Zeus top is the top banking trojan according to SecureWorks, which made major discoveries that these botnets and, and Zeus leveraging has been going on for, for years. And so as you start to put some of this together, you can also leverage the MITRE ATT&CK framework, right? Which really speaks to some of the defense me mechanisms or some of the defense impl implementations, implementations you can uh, put together to support this. So you create this really a five W's that becomes that cyber design based threat. And so if you break it out into something small, you come up with three or four of these to support sometimes, uh, you know, from the training, uh, from the Carver training, they really try to get you to leverage, uh, you know, six, six to 10. But if you can put some of these in a, in a, in a write up, and I'm putting an example here, uh, just saying an attack planned and conceived by a hacker group with, with, uh, without authorized access or information attempting to access and using remote web access, submitting malicious document, right? So if somebody submitted a malicious document, into Salesforce or into this, into whatever CRM you have. And then knowing that the outside actor intends to cause data exfiltration, right? So they're expecting to utilize that to compromise some systems on the other end, or maybe even in that system itself, right? So having that created that scenario of what you think could be trying to happen, then you also put some weight behind that. What this does is this assists you in validating and prioritizing what you need to get after fixing. And again, because we're so, at this time, we're so we're so well informed, you can leverage, like I said, the, the minor attack framework there. And you know that, uh, for example, just to hear, we're saying that here's what, here's what can occur. Here's what we're thinking could be leveraged, you know, from a report from, from a vendor talking about Zeus. Now you look that up in the minor attack framework, it walks you through some of the defensive measures you can put. And the whole method and the whole reasoning behind trying to get this accomplished from the, the Carver methodology is so that you can delay, degrade, disrupt, disrupt, and mitigate some of the activities that the bad actor, the nation state actor, adversary, heck, even insider is trying to accomplish against your critical inf information systems, critical information, critical personas that you've defined as you walk through this. After you've done that legwork, what you can do now is create work streams and a better informed incident response capability, not only for the mitigation and the defense implementation, but also on how you act. You know, oftentimes we see that incident response is that four phase approach, but there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good way to look at it from a strategic standpoint. However, you as the person doing the implement implementation, do doing actually the incident response has to know that there's more steps to it, right? And it helps you understand where you are, right? So you're looking at the preparation, identification, notification, initial containment, analysis, informed containment, eradication, recovery, and follow-up. And the things we're doing right now that you're gaining from this opportunity here is to help you better understand 
that, that from a standpoint of, hey, who's involved with this as we, we develop? That will help me on the notification, that initial containment, because you already set up these key defense mechanisms, having done the assessment from the Carver standpoint and the analysis of knowing what you're going to be looking at because you've you've looked at the problem, you've looked at that critical information system and realized that, hey, these are the implementation I have. Where This is where I'll be getting the data to support my ability to, to recover from this, right? And so that provides that informed containment as you walk through this kind of uh, thing. Now, as you enhance that work stream support, the great part is it's, you've got that homework, you've done the quiz, you've taken the test when it comes to this, right? And now it also helps you decrease the buy-in time when you, have to, when you have to take control and you have to do something because of the fact that everyone who was a stakeholder from those business units who provided that information for you up front, they know what you're looking at, right? They understand because they were part of the reason why that became one of the things you have to support. And and when you finally rack and stack those things uh, from a standpoint of the qualitative and the quantitative approach to it, um, you get a better understanding of which fire to address first. And the backing is that you've done the, the done the homework, right? It gives you that increased understanding, and not only you, but as you brief anybody else coming out of it, it helps everyone get aligned with that. Now it increases the clarity. What's important now is we know that cybersecurity assessments, right? The audits that you have to deal with. Uh, and being able to budget for future uh, upgrades and security implementations. We know that these things are vetted out even a little more as you do these extra steps to find out what those critical information systems are. Well, I'm very hopeful that uh, during the conversation today, you had an opportunity to, to understand why you know, I'm working to leverage the Carver, Carver methodology uh, to really get after helping folks identify their critical information, their critical systems, and their critical personas when it comes to the risk management, right? So the people, process, and technology, you can build on that. Building this effort here will allow you to better understand what work streams and how you can manage and task out people to do specific jobs. And the process is improved because you know now what to get after, what, what is a priority and what you're going to mitigate. And then the technology piece to this for the risk mitigation is really understanding how everything aligns and how you will throw things at the problem set, right? Uh, so to the far corner is my... It wasn't malware. It wasn't you taking you to a bad website. That's actually a, um, access to my LinkedIn profile so we can connect. I uh, really hope you learned a lot from this and always feel free to reach out to me. Um, some of the resources leveraged uh, through this uh, training here were, the, of course, CSI Linux. Uh, they, they have a great tool set uh, and it's really helpful in identifying, you know, some of the things you can find find on the web, uh, as well as a good way to, to maneuver around some of the security posture you currently have. And then Security Management International, uh, they provide the, the Carver, Carver training, Carver assessment training. And then of course, the information we use to understand the current threats that help you build that cyber, um, that cyber threat uh, landscape is the 2022 State of the Threat uh, from SecureWorks. So thank you for your time. I'm Joey Hernandez and feel free to reach out to me anytime uh, to work through any of your problems. Appreciate you. Thanks.